Welcome back to the Kevin Pollack Chat Show. I am, as always, Chat Show. How the hell are you? So uh, wonderful that you could join us for this uh, particular podcast because um, my guest today is a uh, longtime hero, first-time caller, uh, although he's actually sitting across from me or, or next to me or caddy corner. We'll, we'll figure that out once uh, uh, I bring him into the fold. Um Jamie and Sam uh, are not with me. This is a uh, a recording taking place at the Airwolf Studios in Hollywood and beautiful. Was Hollywood ever beautiful? Well, I think it was, but it was at least 60 years ago. Um, probably more. Uh, you know where Airwolf is. Stop by. Let us know your thoughts about the entire enterprise and conglomerate that is known as Airwolf. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to meet you. Come on by. I'm here, Scott Ackerman. Everyone's just always hanging out, waiting for you to stop by. The address is so easy to find and so easy to get up the elevator. Uh, write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Let us know what you think of the damn show. I'm going to read a couple of your uh, fan mails today. Uh, so brace yourself. Recent guests, you may wonder. All right, stop with the questions. Brian Cranston, Billy Bob Thornton, Jenna Fisher, Christopher Guest, Lauren Graham, Paul Reiser, O, oh, and Rika Gervais. No big whoop. That was a damn fun one. They're all fun. Uh, tune in, turn on, drop out. Upcoming guests, Jennifer Chili, Pamela Adlon, Louis Anderson, just to name three. Uh, and um, before we get to... Uh, Viewer, listener, mail. Are you watching The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon Prime? Uh, I, I, uh, I, I am so, uh, I guess proud is the word. I've not been proud, so I think that's the word I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of my work in a very, very long time. That is to say, um, and maybe I'll talk to our guest today about it, um, the performer's uh, profession – be it actor, director, writer, comedian, I wear so many odd hats, um, is, is a strange profession in that we are judged differently by the public when we simply work for money. You know, the way everyone else does? <laughs> We're not allowed to work for money. We have to treat our careers like porcelain eggs. Um, it took me many, many years to, to realize that, that the audience – the people at large, you, they don't really care what you do as long as they like it. They're not keeping track on your glorious career path. Many of them could not give a shit uh, as long as they like it, whatever you do. I hosted a game show once, and I thought, mm, this might not be the smartest career move. But when I met with the producers, they convinced me that Johnny Carson had hosted a game show, Groucho Marx had hosted a game show, because like those shows and those hosts, I will be allowed to improvise on live tele – well, pre-tape, you know, as live with an audience um, in primetime television. And I thought, OK, that's reason enough. Plus also I could do 10 episodes in a week and that would be 10 paychecks in one week. Um, but again, I worried what uh, – my so-called fans, that's the name of a good book, um, would think. And I found out they don't – they like the show. So they didn't really give a shit that I was concerned that I was hosting a game show suddenly. But rather they enjoyed the game show and what I did. And so I stopped caring as much about um, the grand scheme. Well, I, I probably stopped caring a long, long, long before that what the grand scheme was supposed to be because I believe uh, every now and then you just got to make the donuts. Uh, uh, which um, I've made a time or 12. But it is weird uh, uh, that in our minds as performers, within the industry, and by that I mean the business, uh, we're not allowed to simply work for money, to work for a living. We have to choose things uh, that will serve the, the trajectory and the good standing. Um, and there you go. So uh, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Amazon Prime that I mentioned about 40 minutes ago, uh, just, just prior to the rant, um, from the creator of The Gilmore Girls, Amy Sherman Palladino and her husband Dan Palladino, those brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writers. It's lush. It's beautiful. It's a period piece that takes place in 1958 um, and ultimately <clears throat> is involved in 
the beginning, the origin story of a stand-up comedy career of this woman in 1958. And, um, I mean, it starts in the setting as the Upper West Side Jews, and it's very Jew, Jew, Jewy, Jewy, Jewington. And, um, you know, she's uh, she breaks from the pack and, uh, and ends up down in the village at this place called the Gaslight, where there's a Lenny Bruce character, and he's wonderful. Luke Kirby, is the actor's name. And... Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a beautiful show. It's stunning, gorgeous, and so well written. And it's probably the best reviewed show I've also been in in, in twenty five years. Uh, love letter from the New York Times. I don't remember the last time I said that. I really truly don't. Um, <clears throat> the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. All right, you trip over the title. I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, but once you're watching a show, who gives a shit what it's called. You know what I'm saying? Do you? Again, write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Now, your letters. Uh, the first one is actually from Danny, D-A-N-I, uh, which always makes me think a woman. If not, uh, sue me, arrest me, and throw me in man jail. I love you, says Danny, on The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Hey, look at that. I've never heard you talk so fast. Yes, uh, Amy Sherman Palladino and Dan write um, for for people who talk very, very fast. Uh, Danny continues, I've been a fan of Gilmore Girls forever and became a fan of yours when I listened to your interview with Lauren Graham earlier this year when you talked on the podcast about being involved in Amy Sherman Palladino's new show. I was eager to see two of my worlds collide. Hmm. Uh, I hope to see more of you in season two. And an interview with your marvelous Mrs. Maisel castmates creators would be exciting to hear. Graciously getting out of your face, Danny. Well, thank you, Danny. Unbelievably sweet and intelligent and, um, and appreciate it. You will see more of me in season two. That is all I'm allowed to say at this point. Announcements to come. Next letter. Uh, and also just utterly flattered. And, and tell everyone you've ever met, Danny, to watch the show. It would be wonderful. Um, although apparently we're 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 doing extremely well in the Rotten Tomatoes ratings. This is something I also haven't said since the Rotten Tomatoes became a thing. People would tell me about, oh, we got this, we got that on Rotten Tomatoes. Never tracked anything I was in. You know why? Yeah, you do. Didn't think we'd uh, the number would be that impressive. So I wasn't interested in any bad news. We are in the mid to high 90s on the Rotten Tomatoes with the Maisel. Uh, whatever the fuck that means. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Pollock. I'm a huge fan, but is there need to gush? Um, let's see who's writing this. This is coming from Sean. Yes, Sean, there's always need to gush. There's a particular article of clothing that I have been vintage hunting and web scouring for. Well, it's been quite some time now to no avail. I'm writing to you because what? Because I have a clothing shop? I read on. I want the same type of Porsche jacket that you wore in The Usual Suspects. There are four reasons why. Uh, before I read them, I'm going to predict I care about one of them. One, it's a fucking badass unique article that immediately conveys a sense of indi individualism, cleverness, and a heightened awareness of retro panache. Wow, <laughs> that's heavy, man. Number two, it reminds me of someone from my childhood with the aforementioned qualities that I can't quite recollect. My best guess is that it was from my first dirt bike mechanic. Hmm. All right, Sean. Three, it's incredibly rare that I choose favorite, but that jacket was the best article of wardrobe in the entire film, which, by the way, is easily in my top three of most viewed films, and I suspect, pun intended, I assume, that you selected that jacket yourself. Number four, there's a low probability either you know some secret source where I can buy one of the jackets or... Maybe you just want to gift the jacket oh. to me. Thanks for your time and attention. Regards, Sean. Uh, I was wrong in my prediction about how many of the four uh, I would care about. As it turns out, the four reasons you've given interest me not. Um, I will say that you're not the first to comment on the Porsche jacket. We'll also say it was uh, 23 years ago. 
I don't have a fucking clue whose idea the Porsche jacket was. I, I, I always go into a wardrobe fitting and have a thing or two to say. So it is possible that I picked it from two or three or four. Um, it's also possible that I didn't. I, uh, it's, on, it's been on a need-to-care basis all these years, uh, and I don't. Um, so I can't help you find it. I can't gift it to you. I, if you've already scoured the internet, I'm going to guess it doesn't exist because if it did, it would. You'd know. Um, also check eBay. Um, that's all I got for you, but thank you, Sean. Our last letter comes to us from Finland. Hi, I'm from Finland. That's it. That's all they wrote. No. <laughs> they, the uh, Jukka. Mm, Jukka. Jukka. Topinen. 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 Okay, from Helsinki. Our guest will absolutely be able to help with this. Uh, hi, I'm from Finland, and I guess we have the same problem here as what I've heard you guys have across. Uh-oh. It's probably them calling. Oh, it's uh, Jeff Abram who helped set up this interview. Ah. Hi, Jeff. We're live on the show. Uh, just answered your call to let you know that uh, crisis averted. A repeat, crisis averted. That is all. Okay. <laughs> he tried to talk and I hung up. Um, uh, have a good time, I think is what he was saying. I, I, I've heard you guys have the same problem across the bond. The bond? Yeah. But that's uh, a misprint. They meant to say pond? Well, in, in Finnish, a pond is bond. Okay, good. I hope that's true. Nowadays, there is no good talk show on telly. I've been wondering where it's all gone. I found the answer about a fortnight ago. I can't wait to discuss with our guest how long a fortnight is. I have a feeling he'll know. Um, it's on YouTube. YouTube suggested a video where Kevin Pollack is interviewing Ricky Gervais. I thought, that's interesting. What is that like? I like Ricky Gervais, and that's the guy from Casino. Casino and a few good men. I watched the interview and it was great. Hmm, no mention of the uh, Porsche jacket, right. usual suspect. Just like the good old talk shows where an interviewer asks a question from the interviewed and then lets him or her actually talk without any other bullcrap. I don't know why I haven't heard about this earlier, but I'm glad I did. It's the greatest thing um, since I've watched several episodes now and I like them all. As we in Finland are approaching the dead winter nights with no sunlight, uh, lots of snow, and minus 20 degrees Celsius, oy, it's great to know you have something to watch when you get home from work. Thanks for each and every one of you who have contributed in making this awesome chat show. Keep up the good work. Uh, Huka Tapanen. Tapanen, yeah. Tapanen. It's a tough language, Finnish. Iksikaksi pulbinelli. Oh, my. Let's get right to it. Please welcome my guest, Phil Proctor. Phil! I'm welcome. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so you've spent time in the Finland? Yeah, I was married to a Norwegian. I'll say. Yeah, what are you fit met the Norga peak, I'll say. Wow. And my daughter is very beautiful, accordingly, you know. Sure, sure. At least half of her is really beautiful. Cashed in at the gene pool lotto, did <laughs> oh, you? Oh, <laughs> boy. That, I tell you, that, uh, that Norwegian strain mm. can be, but, you know. And yeah. part of it is because of those dark nights. I've been in my... Minus 20 Celsius. I've, in, in Oslo, it actually froze the fjord in waves. I saw frozen waves because wow. a, a fjord is a combination of glacial water and salt water. That's correct. So I, it was frozen waves. It was like time was stopped. Yeah, know? that would be eerie. It is. It yeah. was very eerie. In one eerie and out the other. Uh-huh. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I've not been. I'm hearing a lot of from people who go to Iceland now. Yes, and Iceland. stay in the ice hotel. Yes, that no, it's the nice hotel. But uh -huh. The end fell off. Right. So they, they <laughs> said, okay, this is good. We're going to the ice but hotel. have you heard from people who are staying in an, in a in a? I know about the ice hotel. Right. And and I, it sounds wonderful. It sounds like a lot of fun. I'm not sure it's my cup of tea mm. or my frozen It would be latte. iced tea. I believe it would be yeah, iced tea. Yeah, it would have to be iced tea. Yeah. But I, I'm not exactly sure. But uh, I know the country is really beautiful and it's very hip. It's, it is a country, uh, Iceland, yes. where it, it's either Greenland or Iceland. It doesn't matter. Where the conservative party is there to conserve social democracy, mm. democratic socialism. Imagine. Yeah. Wow. So it's a different a different culture in Iceland and Greenland. Considerably. Yeah. Ancient. Um, yeah. 
Now, you grew up in Goy, Indiana. Close. Goshen, <laughs> right? Yeah, you move the letters around, it's he's gone. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I'm of Amish and Irish ancestry. Also. Okay. Yeah. But it, it, although I'm not Jewish, I'm Hamish. Uh, okay. Do you know what I mean? I do. And, and also, coming from the Midwest, uh, where are you from originally? San Francisco, California. Yeah, well, that's not anywhere near the Midwest. No, no. <laughs> no, no. no. Uh, the, the Midwest, uh, small town, mm-hmm. still there, still small, but, you know, still happy. Uh, but I had, a, I had a wonderful schizophrenic upbringing because my dad and mom moved to New York when I was a kid, and I spent all my summers in Goshen with my grandparents. Oh, wow. The Yoders. How old were you when the family moved to New York? About five. So – you you did have a little time in, in New York in in yeah. no prior to it in Goshen sure. in Goshen and which Goshen is that and small Elkhart. town you were mentioning that small town effect yeah. Yeah. Uh, now known as Main Street Disneyland uh, you uh, then moved to New York yes. how startling is that for well, a five year old it, it was all all of it was normal you know when you're uh, when you're growing up sure. It's normal, whatever it is. There's no awareness. To, yeah, no, and it can be a horrible life that you're leading, but it's normal. It's and you the have norm. To, you have to learn to, to live with it. I had a gifted, beautiful life. Mm-hmm. Uh, both of my parents were could have gone into show business, really. My dad became a lawyer because his father, Robert E. Proctor, who was a state senator of mm. Indiana, Fred Elkhart, uh, and was responsible for actually exposing the Ku Klux Klan in northern Indiana in the 30s, he wanted dad to, you know, to be, part of the law firm. Right. So my father, who was really an outdoorsman, who wanted to spend time in Arizona, was forced to become a suit. Really. Wow. And that that damaged him in a particular way, but it was also kind of wonderful because when a little uh, adjustment that he made was to become an entrepreneur oh. and to find uh, inventions. So he would come back to the house with like a Polaroid camera. Yes. You know, which, whoa, what's this? Or a transistor. He brought me the first transistor. What? So this is going to replace, you know, the glowing tubes. Uh, so I had, and also uh, he had show Toys. business friends. He had show business friends. Where I lived on East 94th Street in apartment 6B, across the hall was Max Gordon, who ran the, 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 the he hired Lenny Bruce, among yeah, others, yeah. Uh, the, the Village Vanguard yeah. and the Blue Angel, and right. he was a producer. So I'd go over there with my mom and dad when I was maybe seven or eight for cocktail parties, and I'd meet Henry Morgan, who sure, was a, sure. you know, a wonderful, cynical radio personality yeah. type, and Maggie Hamilton, the oh. Wicked Witch of the yeah. whatever, you know, and all kinds of people. I, 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 I kick myself that I couldn't uh, be more aware of the stuff that I probably, you know, met. During You're upset time. with the seven, eight-year-old year version of you? Well, <laughs> yes. Right? Aren't we all? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this is all, of course, in, in my book, uh, Where's My Fortune Cookie? Yes, which, of all course, right. uh, which we'll I'm talk very about excited about to talk about. And uh, um, I can't wait to read. I've not put my... Uh, I can't I've... wait to read it either, actually. <laughs> but but I, I can tell you what you're going to read. Has the box arrived at the house yet with the books? It did. And yeah. I actually, I, I thought you'd have one. And if you don't, I'll get it out of the trunk of my car. You know, I should it's have, under a body right now. I right? should have. That's right. I should have uh, mentioned that to Jeff Abram when he called in briefly, who's done a wonderful job looking after you and help uh, facilitate our yeah, sit. He, 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 uh, worked he was supposed to get theater. me a book. That oh, and he bitch. didn't get you a book. Well, right? you'll have time to think about what to write to me in the book. I can't wait. And did you do an audio version of it? I have not yet done but an audio version. Please do. Thank you. Yeah, I, please I do, do want to. And uh, I, I did one for mine, and it's it's daunting. Yeah, I know. And in my case, three days. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. you should never do it in one. It's just too much. Oh no, I've I've done book narrations you okay, before, great. Okay, but great. not never my own. Oh, no. and of course, the thing that's odd about it is that there are some mistakes in the book. You know, because when you put a book out there, especially it's an autobiography. Yes. Honk, honk, you know? yeah. So you put a book out there, and uh, we didn't do a, a hell of a lot of fact checking on it. Uh, but we did some. Sure. And we did it primarily by put, letting people read it. And they say, oh, no, that's not right. This is da, da, da. So I got a review the other day that said that something I said about Cloris Leachman mm. wasn't quite right. I said that she'd won an Academy Award for Young Frankenstein, which she should have. Should have. Right. But instead it was for something else. Yes. I can't remember what it was. But uh, the story about Cloris Leachman was the fire sign- – Look, I have to say this to start with. The thing that we really have in common mm. is that we're 
in our own way, Renaissance men. We wear many hats. Yeah. We, we have juggled different aspects yes. of career, yes. which is one of the reasons that you've had a, a nice, creative, longevity in well, your career. We have, yes. But we have, too. I've shared, yeah. I shared that with you. I've done television and yeah, films everything. And movies, just about everything. But, uh, but th- I do find that when, when you can concentrate, like you've got a character now, obviously, that you're enjoying doing, mm. and you're getting an opportunity yeah. to, to shine in it and to, right. and to right. have some fun. And, and because I uh, uh, joined the Firesign Theater, which is more of a cultural, satirical career uh, for men, uh, it, it really took me off the path of the movies and the films sure. and the stuff. And I regret some of that only because uh, making movies, for instance, is so much fun. Well— it's hard it, work, it, but it, it's it, really fun. It's it shouldn't even be called work. It's so much fun. If you I ever don't. hear an actor complain, slap him. Well, you were talking for, about for a being day and paid. A the idea of being right. paid. You know, right. it's, it's it's true that we want to make a living doing what we do. Yeah, there's no doubt about it because right. that's that's it's a form of uh, uh, recognition. Okay. That yes, and also uh, you're worth something. You're worth something. Your it, yeah, and. Um, you also want to be able to make a living as yeah. a, as a chosen profession. That's right. Uh, but but also, I think it, as you said, it 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 offers you a, a, a level of confidence when you've been validated by employment. Yes, right? and, and by your peers. Yeah, you know? but l- let's talk a, a a little bit about Firesign Theater because you mentioned um, it derailed your your plans, perhaps, uh, yeah, it, of getting of into film and, and the path that mm-hmm. I was taking. Broadway, off Broadway, right? Soap. I was in a soap opera, The Edge of Night, right? Uh, you know, and it was I was when I got out of Yale. Well, I got out of Yale, <laughs> you know, drama school. I did some drama school thing. Got out of Yale, and I was on the the, the normal kind of actor's path. Sure. But then it got diverted much later, really. But w- once that diversion happened, once the Firesign Theater happened, that became a an, a fifty year career. Absolutely, and fifty years. Yes. So I I wish I could extract the regret. If there was a surgical procedure, I would put it on gloves immediately. I because think- I will tell you, um, you you and the fellas of the Firesign Theater were for me and. So many other comedians of my age, ilk, generation, uh, the first introduction to subversive comedy. True. And later to be educated on all things Lenny and Carlin and so on. Mm. But the Firesign Theater records, to me, I I, I probably got in on the third one. Um, Is that dwarf? Don't crush that dwarf. Hand me the pliers. Yes, that's the one. And um, uh, released, I have, in 1970. Uh In 1983, the New Rolling Stone magazine record guide named it as the greatest comedy album ever made. In 2005, the U.S. Library of Congress added Uh, the album to the National Recording Registry, calling Firesign Theater the Beatles of Comedy. Comedy. uh, And they gave us lunch. Yeah, and they and, and they gave, they gave you us lunch. lunch. Yeah, damn fine lunch and, too. And, uh, and as Martha, I uh, and Martha of Martha and Vandellas uh-huh. was sitting to my right. Well, there you go. And Jimi Hendrix's cousin was sitting to my left. Jimi Hendrix's cousin, cousin, because he represented was there the catalog, to, right. which uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix work, which is also inducted the same time. That, yeah, uh, you're not going to get that working on the edge of night. No, sir. All right, Phil. No, that's right. Um, uh, I I hear what you're saying in regards to derailment, but when you can affect a generation and when you can make history um, with um, your own um, imaginings, your own complete creative control, I'm assuming. True. Absolutely true. And you can affect a generation and change the way people think. Yeah. I think you um, – I would encourage you. I would I feel, beg you. I feel validated. <laughs> to, to hold. By the way, here's, here's my parking ticket. Yeah, 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 of course. Validate that too. Well, I know, I know. Thank I, you. Thank you, In doctor. my introduction when I performed – Live, um, I always have them mention uh, the Comedy Central named me one of the top 100 comedians of all time because it sounds so good. But that and seven dollars will get me a cup of coffee well, at Starbucks. Well, I think it was Rolling Stone that listed us as one of the 100 best acts, yeah, as well. You know, yeah. so that, that's a feather in your cap, it is. But, but, um, which is very nice, by the way, that that Tyrolean cap. look suits you very well, <laughs> that's right. goes well with the leader hosen, <laughs> yes. 
Um, take so, me to your leader hose. <laughs> take me to your leader hose and the name of my fourth book. Uh, so where's my forger cookie? Now it's filled with stories, and I'd love to discuss ma- as many as you would like. Yes, since you haven't read if it. If we had a book here, a copy, I would have you read from it. Oh my God! But uh, of course, uh, I can. I've memorized Jeff the Abrams. Parts. Let us down on that regard as well. So I want to start with a time that a psychic friend predicted yes, you'd yes. be involved in a shooting in San Francisco Chinatown restaurant. Yes, in and your then hometown. you were. Yeah, yes, I was. So yes. let's go with the prediction first. Okay. Let's go in All chronological right. order. Your friend is a psychic, and the psychic predicts. A very pretty psychic. Mm. Her name was Sharon. But what happened was, uh, see, the thing about the book, since you, you haven't read it, yeah. the thing about the book is, it, uh, but this you'll relate to, it's about all the people and the funny connections yes. that we make, right. especially in our level of work and the kind of people that we, yeah. we run across. It's very empathetic. Yes. And and I, in the book, I've really tried to be honest about all of these bizarre coincidences yeah. that have happened to me yeah. that led me into the Firesign Theater. Okay, really, okay? okay so, good. So, Sharon... Uh, there was a time when Firesign uh, was just getting started, not too far from here on Columbia Square. Wow. We were recording in old radio studios in the old Columbia right. building, okay, right. and uh, which they later converted into A and A and R uh, offices when the when the record industry started t- taking off. Sure, but anyway, we were recording our first records in. Oh, radio studios, and uh, and that gave us a tremendous freedom, and we, we we began to get well known. First of all, we were given a uh, a special contract, and the contract gave us unlimited studio time. It's crazy, which is what it is, and that's one of the reasons why we could make these complex, layered yes. comedy recordings because yes. we were not being charged as producers for our studio time. Uh, a guy named John McClure at Columbia made that possible, and then. Uh, I, I ran into people like Jeremy Clyde of Chad and Jeremy, uh-huh. who was recording down there as Great well. British duo. Yeah, and we became pals, and we uh, shared a, a rental property uh, on Balboa Avenue mm. that had an ape cage, a tiki bar, a flaming fountain, and a bomb shelter <laughs> where we kept our pot. Mm-hmm. And a, a, a an Olympic sized swimming pool where we kept our women because this was in this was in the the end of the sixties and early seventies. Yes. the sexual revolution happened, which was summer so of love daunting. was sixty nine. Yeah, I mean, w- woman power yes. was really manifesting. There, That's right, and it was somewhat intimidating. I'll it's say. so interesting that we're at this point now yeah. where women are regaining their power and yes. reclaiming their power again. Right. But but at that particular time, so I'm hanging out with with uh, Jeremy. Clark wonderful guy, still a friend. We saw him in London in a play he was doing. And uh, uh, and, and all of a sudden, uh, oh no, what was the story? What was the question you asked me? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the psychic. Ah, the psychic, yes. So one of the girls yes. uh, who was living with us in this huge mansion was a girl named Sharon okay. from Atlanta, Georgia. And she was the head of the Elvis Presley fan club. But, but I digress. Yeah. And, and I, also I'm actually a... undressing, too. Here, let me button this up. Uh, and, and so I knew her then. Yeah. Uh, many years later, after Fireside Theater had gone through really a very successful uh, evolution, and, and I had branched off with Peter Bergman, mm-hmm. who was the, 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 the founder, creator of it, uh, from a show called Radio Free Oz on listener-supported radio right. here in Los Angeles, where I first connect, reconnected with him because we'd gone to Yale together. Mm. It's all in the book. It's very confusing. It's a long, confusing. It's not story. confusing. It's not confusing. Wonderful. But it, but it's a, it's a thread. So many years later, uh, we're touring. Uh, 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 Peter and I, right. and we were going we to play the bottom line or the bitter end or the bitter line or the bottom end, I can't mm-hmm. remember, in New York, and uh, we had just performed in Chicago. We were going to be interviewed by Alger Hiss's son, Tony Hiss, for the uh, for, for the New Yorker magazine, because we were doing some alien characters. Oh, wow. And while we went on the, the, the plane trip, we ran into Steven Spielberg, who was scouting locations for Close Encounters, and we'd already known him because he used to hang out with us at a place called The Farm. All of these connections, yeah, unbelievable, beautiful. So anyway, uh, I'm in Chicago. We had performed in Chicago, and I, the, I looked Mr. at this Kelly's, newspaper. Was it Mr. Kelly's? By no, chance? it was the Quiet Night. I think. Okay, it's called the Quiet Sorry. Night. Sorry. And uh, I, I look in the newspaper, and there's an article about this guy named Yuri Geller. Sure, Yuri I remember Geller, right? And he could bend spoons with he, his mind. That was his thing. You know, he could and, bend spoons yeah, with his stop mind. Stop watches and everything. So uh, I, I said, I got very excited. I said to Peter, Who wouldn't? Yeah, who would? A man can bend and, spoons with right, his mind. And we're playing aliens. He was 
also in contact with aliens in the desert uh -huh. in Israel. He's working with a guy named Andrea Baharich, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and so I get very excited. I said, we got to meet this guy. Yeah. We get, he may be for some materials. So we go to New York. Uh, I get to the club, and there's a message for me. And it's from Sharon, and it's uh, like a Woodstock area code, upstate New York or something. And I, didn't, I don't know a Sharon. So uh, uh, the message is, Uri Geller wants to meet you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Folks, you should have seen his eyebrows go up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's an incredible message. <laughs> Luckily, you're wearing message. a hat. Yeah, that would have gone <laughs> so off like, my head. Oh, my God. So, yes, so this is message. So I put material in that night. I said, ah, oh, Uri Geller, born with a bent spoon in his mouth. And uh -huh. Blah, 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 nice. blah. And, and, of course, after the show, I immediately called this mysterious person. Sharon. And it's Sharon. It's Sharon. She's now been married. I'll say. She has a kid, mm. and she's changed her name, you know. To Sharon. To Sharon. But she says, I'm up in Ossining, New York. Mm. Uh, and, and I said, on bail, you know, no. I'm up yeah. in Ossining, New York, working with Andrea Boharich and Uri Geller uh, in this, this, you know, higher mind studies and everything. Would you want to come up and see me? Of course. Yes, I said, yes. So I, I get my way up there, and we spent a wonderful uh, evening together, and during the course of that evening, she said, she got very serious at one point, she said, I'm sorry, I don't like to tell people bad news, but, but I think you need to know this. You and Peter are going to perform somewhere, and after the show, you're going to be involved in a shooting. People will be killed and wounded around you, but you and Peter will es escape Un unscathed, and it's it's foreigners are involved. It's some kind of a like a gangland thing. Oh, wow! So, and I, and what is your? I mean, in that uh, pocket of life where yes. you are with these extraordinary people, information like that is not like hearing it at Wexler's Deli. No, it's, it's coming it from seriously. high atop. Yeah, it's uh, coming from somewhere, mm. and uh, so I took it seriously. But then, of course, I forgot all about it. Until I find myself lying under a table. How long do we suppose? How much time had gone? <laughs> it was about by? two and a half months, I would say. Wow, about two and a half months. And it was in Chinatown, San Francisco. Yeah, Chinatown. It was the Joe Fong gang versus the watching who were watching from behind <laughs> and and went under the table like I did. Right. And uh, uh, it was a revenge shooting because of the the watching. Is had, there any other kind? <laughs> no, I guess not. But unlike the Italians, okay, it wasn't neat. See. <laughs> <laughs> it was messy. Uh, the three guys, one with a machine gun, uh, boom, 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 just never stopped, and a shotgun and a pistol. And basically, the people who were killed and wounded, five killed, 11 wounded, were all innocent people because the, the watching gang were behind me, and they all just filed out when the guys finally left. But that morning, I had learned that my Norwegian wife, Barbara Seymingsen, was pregnant. All right, which is why she did not come up to San Francisco with us, right. and which is why I ended up in the restaurant because you know otherwise the light life would have been would have changed. Yes. So I'm lying under the the steel column of the table, and there's a drawing of it on the cover of my book. Here, I'll hold up. An oh, it's beautiful. Isn't that great? Uh, who did that drawing? Bob Grossman. Oh, okay, great. Who, who was Peter Bergman's roommate at wow. Yale? Wow. Oh, what? What? That's okay. crazy. Uh, and he would, and it did the dwarf cover, right. which shows us as yes. astrological fire signs. All right, so I'm lying under there, and and the shooting is going on. And uh, people are uh, dropping and screaming and glasses and uh, and I'm thinking it's, it was yin and yang. I'm thinking I'm either going to be a father mm. and that's going to be a responsible trip or I'm dead, in which case I have no responsibility. That's right. Right? And yeah. I really don't have a lot of choice right now no. over which one of those, which path God is going to open to me. That was being me. decided for you. It, yes. And and the, the path that was, thank God, uh, if, if you believe or not believe, I don't care. Thank somebody. Anyway, it was a wonderful outcome because I survived, Peter survived. The guy who brought us in, Dr. Bill Alexander, however, had been shot. My. A machine gun slug had ricocheted off the floor, entered the heel of his boot. You had to squeeze his boot to see where the bullet went in. And he's carrying that bullet 40 years later behind his knee because it was too much trouble to take out. It went up through his boot 
And up, ended in the, uh, the back of his knee. The back of his knee. And this was 40 years ago, September. Maybe that was the, the other magic bullet. Yes. Uh, now, w when you're under the table, yeah. does Sharon cross I've your been mind? Under, I've been under the table a lot. Kevin, Kevin. <laughs> I understand. I'm sure, I'm sure I'll meet the, you there sometime. This particular time. Oh, yeah, but this was, uh, I, I, uh, yeah. Did Sharon come to mind in her prediction? No. No. Because I was going to say, if it did, it'd be wonderful. Because in the prediction, you're going to be fine. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And, and I think in the back of my mind, uh -huh. that was happening. Because a couple of other interesting coincidences. No sooner had the shooting stopped with the smell of cordite heavy in the air. Uh, some guy came out with a, you know, had been shot in the hand. I wrapped a napkin around his hand. In comes a cameraman and a lighting man. And they scan the scene. And then they disappear. And I look at Peter. I say, what the hell was that? How did that? And the next thing I know, in comes cops and uh, medics. And they're they're doing triage and saving people and uh, sure. uh, whatever. And uh, that was wh – what is that all about? Well, here's what happened. Uh, the Symbionese Liberation Army at that time – do you remember? Uh, they, they were quite a force Patty Hearst. there. Yes, exactly. They were phoning in bomb threats. Right. And so they would phoned one into that area of town because I think a democratic convention was going to be happening or something. So the, the emergency equipment and the news people and the police were there and they heard the shooting. Wow. And that's why only five died. Now, the co-author of my book is a fellow named Brad Schreiber. Yes. Brad just released a book called Revolution's End, which is the story of the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. Oh, my. <laughs> right, right. Oh, my. Yes. So there's even another strange, bizarre thing. And, of course, the, the title of the book, Where's My Fortune Cookie, available at Amazon. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the title of the book doesn't even relate to that shooting. No. <laughs> I'll tell you just one more story. Although, how hip would that have been when the oh, shooting yeah. stopped for you to stand and say, where's, where's my, my fortune, fortune cookie? cookie? Well, we did that the next day. We performed the next day in Boulder, Colorado. Okay. Okay. And so uh, we were we improvised lines. You know, I said uh, we were in this. By now, everybody knew about the shooting. It sure. was the biggest shooting in massacre in American history. At the time, wow. Five and 11. Ah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we, we did material, like I said, we were in this gangland shooting. I'm sure you heard about it. Luckily, I ordered the duck. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> nice. Right? Bergman yeah. says, and I ordered the scared prones. Okay? <laughs> uh -huh. Bergman's mind. Uh, 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 but we never got our fortune cookie. Well, yeah. Now, the title of the book comes from a memorial for Peter Bergman. Peter Bergman, who, I, as I said, I met at Yale. He wrote the lyrics for two musicals that I starred in, written by Austin Pendleton, you may mm, know, mm, another yeah. Renaissance man. Uh, and uh, many years that I connected with him again on, on Radio Free Eyes. Well, he passed away five years ago. Peter. Peter, of uh, uh, complications of leukemia. And uh, uh, we had a memorial service for him up north where he'd been living and at Washington State and then down at the Electric Lodge – Mm -hmm. in Venice. And at that uh, event, one of our backers, one of the, the, the women who'd, who'd uh, traveled and helped us with merchandise and everything, she bought fortune cookies with Peter Bergman's face on them in, on the plastic outside and inside his date of birth and death and a line from Firestone Theater Records. Great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. What a thoughtful thing. It, it gave them out to everybody. So after uh, the, the uh, service was over, I said to her, that was really thoughtful of you, Gretchen, to do that. Uh, be and it was because of the gangland shooting and everything. She said, what? I said, y y you know, the, the Golden Dragon Massacre? The what, what are you talking about? I said, wait a minute, Gretchen. You're telling me you don't know that Peter and I survived a Chinese gangland shooting. How why did you buy fortune cookies? And she said to me, because Peter came to me in a dream and said I never got my fortune cookie. Oh, my. Oh, my. I'm sorry. The, Phil, please. The, the book is, is filled of, with these honest yeah. things. Yeah. I know they've happened to you. I know they happen to other people. And, and really that, in a sense, is the through line of the book uh, where I might you know, lack in details right. and all. I wanted to tell the, uh, a, a particular personal story about how 
how I've been aware of these things all my life. I've been very empathetic about it. Yeah. Look, we're actors. We observe people. Sure. We observe things. That's where we get our in our, our characters from. Yeah. You know, and our And the unexplained is happening every day all around every us. Every day. Yeah. But we are more aware of it because we're conscious. Right. Of that, our job is is you know I imagine that uh, somebody in the Secret Service might be more empathetic because right. they're all, they're looking and checking people out all the time, right? You know, but but when, even in some of the interviews that I've done to promote this book, uh, uh, certain people that I talked to have told me chilling stories about psychic events that happened to them too, right? And they're just undeniable. I'll share one with you. This, Please, this one guy. He, his grandfather passed away, and they had a service for him, or a funeral service, I think it was. And that night, uh, he, he uh, was thirsty, so he went down to the kitchen to get some water. And there was his grandfather standing in the kitchen in a golden bathrobe. And he just kind of, you know, took it in and shook it off and took his water and went upstairs and put this water by the bed table and went to sleep. And the next morning he woke up and he thought, well, I, that was an interesting dream, my grandfather in that golden bathroom. But he looked over and there was a glass of half glass of water. Mm. So he said, wait a minute, maybe I really did go downstairs. So he goes downstairs for breakfast and his mother's there. And he said, you know, mom, last night I came down for some water and I, I dreamed that I saw my grandfather. And she said, well, I dreamt that I saw your my father as well and he was wearing a golden bathrobe wow what the hell yeah now That's... these are people telling you these things i yeah. mean I've, everything that i've written in the book that happened to me is absolutely true right but it, it's it, it goes beyond the uh the debunking of uri geller by randy sure you know what i mean sure yeah. sure listen all we have are our experiences that's right and either you're uh able to shed light on them or just share them yeah because they don't always define themselves do they no they don't but at least we know that we're going to touch somebody's mind. It's the same thing we do when we're acting. Right. You know, we, we touch somebody's heart. We touch somebody's mind. Some of these wonderful letters that you were reading. That's really why we're doing what we're doing, you know. Sure. Uh, because we, we, we feel, as artists, more connected to the world and to the other souls that inhabit the world because it, it's in, incomprehensible to, to, uh, to think about the uh, infinite variety of spirits mm -hmm. that walk the earth and all of the complications. But we can do it through our own manifestations. Right. And we, and as, as we say, we are rewarded for it. Right. Sometimes materially, sometimes spiritually, sometimes with love, yeah. sometimes with adulation. Uh, but it, it's, it is our path. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I, I, um, I think, I think that you're not only um, wonderfully sharing the truths and empathy and experiences that you've had, but that. Uh, but that making them up. But yeah, <laughs> I think at some point you experience enough that you feel not only a desire but a need to share them and yeah. shed light on them. You know, I'm yeah. I'm telling stories in in my book how I slept my way to the middle, <laughs> not just a funny title and technically still available uh, about working with you know Walter Matthau or whoever and mm -hmm. the thing you you. To, to share personal journeys and, and voyages outside the realm of one's uh, uh, showbiz career yeah. um, is considerably more daring, quite frankly, because you're, you're able to get a platform and an opportunity to sell books based on the fact that you are in show business yeah. and that people like myself who have uh, uh, studied at your feet, uh, which, by the way, are quite clean uh, Thank you all much. these years later. And um, my toes are trimmed nicely too. Even aromatic. It gets harder and harder it sure does. every year, it Kevin. It sure does. Yeah, no, you need tools. <laughs> or, um, or you need some tool who's working for you. That's right. That does that job. Right? <laughs> I could use a good tool. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it takes a certain honest, honesty and, and – and, and, Openness uh, yeah, in a way, right? Yeah. I you mean know, bravery is the wrong word because – I uh, I, I think too much is said about um, peace and people. Uh, your personal journey um, 
the same way that you feel you felt the need to share these things, yeah. and um, and hopefully it touches people's yeah, but, lives. But you, you right? also you touched upon the idea. There's a certain degree of daring involved, sure, in what we do. Daring yeah. do, yeah. okay. I mean, uh, for me, I don't know about your your uh, how you found your path in in show business or the show business, as they used to call it. Did sure, you? I mean the show business. Yeah, right? that's right. <laughs> now it's the internet. Yeah, the internet. But, but uh, uh, I found it because I felt really comfortable on stage. Right. And Felt I, at home. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, again, one of the lucky things about growing up in New York uh, was that I, w- I went to this wonderful school, the Allen Stevenson School, and uh, they, they, did a, they do a Gilbert and Sullivan production every year. And it's a boys' school. Right. So being a boy soprano, and, and, and I was, I'd been gifted with this ability to hear and, 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 and repeat music. Right. It was my family, the Yoder family. It was very musical, and there was always singing and music going on in the house. Right. Plus a, a wonderful surreal sense of humor, that Midwestern surreal sense of humor. Right. So I played— And you're a natural mimic, so you're picking these things yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. And, and I played female leads— because I was a boy soprano, and I just felt I felt comfortable in a dress, <laughs> even. I mean, but I felt very comfortable <laughs> with an audience, right? And I felt at ease. And there's a part of you doing. at that, even at that young age, that knows they'll laugh instantly. At, they'll know they'll laugh at this instantly. Yeah. I, I remember I, I, there, I have a friend named Rob Lewin, who is a bassist, and his he's married to Phyllis Katz, who is a wonderful groundling comedian and Indeed. teacher. And uh, he went to grade school with me and everything. He he remembers certain things that I did when I was a kid in school that I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Apparently, once I was forced to eat on. Oh yeah. In the in the in those days, in a school, the auditorium was where you had your meeting in the morning, where we had our orchestra rehearsal. It's the stage that we performed on. It was mm. also a gymnasium, right. and it was a cafeteria. Wow, you know, multi-purpose yeah. room. Sure. So uh, apparently, I I cut up, uh, I, I, cutting up. I cut up my meat. I was I was doing something silly uh, with my food, so I was forced to eat on stage. Uh huh. And he says that I uh, turned my back. I was eating on stage with my back to the audit to, to the cafeteria, and I made everybody laugh. Hmm. I did something right that made everybody laugh, and because again. I didn't mind eating my meal. That was not punishment on to the you. Stage, yeah, in front of everybody, it right. was fun. Yeah, you know, and and, and the first. Oh yeah, you <laughs> talked about the, the being paid. Yeah, the first job I did, I was a child actor. I was like nine years old. I did I did a show called Uncle Danny Reads the Funnies, which Elliot Gould was also on. He was a child actor. Oh wow! And I was and it was before the union. There was no American Federation of Television right. and Radio Artists, and this was a live television show. Wow! Not pre-taped. No. It was live. Yeah. And uh, and we would improvise to the funnies in the Daily News, and it was mm. shot on W down at WPIX TV, and. Uh, uh, we were paid because there was no union in the sponsor's product, right? Which is very common in those days. Sure, hurdy gurdy oranges, and you got a bunch. Of I that. got a bag of hurdy gurdy oranges. That was my first professional. Professional. Job. My first professional uh, performance was for as monetary a, value. No, for more oranges for love. For love, for love. was uh, I was a, a baby uh, back in Goshen, Indiana, back from the hospital. I don't know how old I was, but I was still a baby, and my grandfather was singing a nice militant Christian hymn, my Onward Christian Soldiers, you know, something Find like Find the that. Jews. It, right. And I hummed it back to him. Wow. Okay. And he, he was so startled by this that he brought me downstairs, and I repeated this apparently, this is what my family says, for the, the family that was right. there. And Kevin, that was the last time I ever worked for free. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Even for your family, yes, right. or especially for your That's family. Right. But but that was because I I received the gift of mimicry, yeah. and music, right. Well, it turns out every child learns to speak by mimicking the That's sounds. That's correct. And then some of us are freaks, and yep. we never stop. That's true. Yeah, uh, I I speak seven languages more or less now. I do too, but I can only say the check, please. Oh, the check. Well, that's good. And where's the bathroom? No, mine was always I love you. And please don't arrest me. <laughs> right, we don't arrest me. Right, right. Uh, uh, I I I always 
because of that ability, I always had the the, the ability to hear and repeat yeah. like a little tape recorder in my head. It's a gift and a curse. It's a, it's a wonderful. Well, it's more of a gift than a curse, I think. Sure. For me, uh, the curse is that I'm not living in Europe, right? <laughs> yes. It, but 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 the, the, that gift gave me some wonderful adventures when I was at Yale my freshman year. Uh, I joined the Yale Russian Chorus because I'd been studying Russian. And so I could sing, you know, And I'm singing with all these guys. First of all, that is beautiful. Second of all, I can't believe you remember it all these years later. Third of all, thank you for stopping when you did. Otherwise, (laughs) we'd have to pay rights. That's right. And we don't have a budget. So those would be the last rights because you wouldn't be on the air anymore. (laughs) But but the fact was the Yale Russian Chorus went to the Soviet Union. And My so did you. Year. Yeah. I sure did. Yeah. I sure did. And and so we would sing on street corners and public squares uh, and and then we'd be surrounded by cu- uh, curious Soviet citizens asking us, you know, questions like how old is Ella Fitzgerald? What the yeah, right. Why do you encircle us with missile bases? How much does it cost uh, for a, a quart of milk? And have you tried the chicken Kiev? Yes, I did. <laughs> I actually did. And uh, they, but in, and you're 19, they, 20 the years old? feet were attached. Yeah. I was, I was 18, going, it was 1959. That's 1959. What it was. 1959. See, recognize it. And uh, uh, I remember I, uh, uh, lost my virginity. I still haven't found it, by the way. Uh-huh. If anybody out there has seen Proctor's virginity, would it's you true. please return it? When is the last you time know? you heard someone say, I found my virginity? <laughs> I know. That's right. It's, it's it's the only thing that you really want to lose. Yes. Right? Okay. Uh, anyway, it was a great loss uh, to a, a beautiful little girl in, in uh, uh, English girl named Marion, Marion uh, in uh, Paris, after the trip to the Soviet Union. Now, why did I even mention this? Yeah, because of the year. Yes, yeah, it was 1959. Like, 1959. And, uh, uh, and, and all of those adventures, being able to, to learn to speak conversational Russian right. because they'd be asking the same questions over and over again. And there were 40 of us. And, all and the, once it's uh, translated to you, yeah, you, you hear the you sounds hear it, and you yeah. know what they're asking. And, yeah, and you know how That's to answer amazing. it. right. Because you know, at first I'd say, does anybody interpret? Can you interpret for me? And Pirivodchik, Pajalsta. And then after hearing the things, I, I immediately I picked up on it. Right. And so by the time I ended that trip, I could speak conversational Russian. I still have the ability to clearly. Do that. Now, the, well, not so clearly. I mumble sometimes, but <laughs> but but that came in very handy. This lang- language thing, language thing, language. Uh, in fact, you can speak every language but English. <laughs> right, English is more hard for me to understand the speaking. But uh, you, you get the idea. I try. I try. <laughs> so uh, uh, when I started doing ADR work, looping and dubbing, sure. adding voices to films, right. I, I would get a lot of work because they'd say, okay, Phil, this movie takes place in Russia, mm. in London, mm. I- in France, and in Brooklyn. Okay, I can handle that. You yeah. know? And so I would often get all these wonderful television jobs. And if you if you go to my I, IBDM, uh, I, whatever it's called. IMBD. I, I have a BM. IDBM. Right, IDBM. IBDD. You'll see this huge list yeah. of stuff that I've done. And I'll, almost all of it... Uh, is is adding voices right. to all these wonderful movies. However, <clears throat> I did also then uh, get involved in Disney and Pixar films. Right, and and also the Rugrats, which oh, yeah. has run for how many years now that you've been doing years, that? Fourteen years. I was Howard and the Rugrats. Yeah, we did it so 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 long that they had to put gray into our characters' hair. Wow! When they did the Rugrats, all grown up. Yeah, segment, all of the parents had streaks of of gray or white right. in their little cartoon hair. You know, right? But that yeah, that was a nice a, a long gig. But uh, again, the variety is really what. I've enjoyed most about my career. Yeah, so I have to take you back to uh, my youth. It's 1970. I'm uh, 12 going on 13. My older cousins, the Zuckers, in San Mateo, California, uh, a a lovely suburb, Mm -hmm. um, were 17, 16, and they were of age, and they were smoking pot with their friends, and they had also enjoyed the summer of love. Um, And this... 12, 13-year-old version of me is just fascinated by these 16, 17-year-old kids who are at a perfect time uh, in their lives in this mm-hmm. this movement in the San Francisco area where the hippies were 
basically yeah, right. born, right? That's right, right. yeah. Um, and they also have a, a great sense of humor, and they turned me on to uh, that third album that came out in 1970. Mm -hmm. And I remember I wanted to hear uh, Nick Danger, Third Eye, over and over and over again <laughs> for one tiny little... And, and it's funny, the little things that stay with you. Mm hmm um, there was a butler, and he says to uh, the master of the manor uh, something, and then the master is annoyed and says, Carruthers, leave us alone. And Carruthers says, how much would you like? 5000 10000 <laughs> 15000 And I, that one little um, play, uh, uh, you know, word little play, joke, little word play yeah. uh, stuck with me for the rest of my life, and, and also in terms of writing and just in terms of setting up uh, a misdirect joke. It inspired you, yeah. It truly it, did. Yeah. yeah. That was Catherwood, played by David Osman. Coo -coo -coo -choo. Oh, right. Uh, we did some Beatles references. Yes. That. that was the album, by the way. That was the second album. That was How Can You Be in Two Places at Once When You're Not Anywhere at All, oh, which yeah. is like us right now. That's right. right? And uh, also known as the Marx Lennon album. Yes. Because we had Groucho Marx and John Lennon That's right. in, in a Russian-style propaganda poster. Okay? That's right. Uh, and, and in that uh, particular album, uh, we, we reached a wider audience because people could identify with the form of the parody. Yes. It was, you know, a detective That's right. radio noir shows and movies. Prior to that, it, it was a little harder for uh, the general public to figure out what we were doing. What the hell you were doing. What the hell we were doing. Yeah. You know? And then— And how did that actually begin? How did it begin? Yeah. Because we were on the radio a lot. Right. We did a lot, a lot, a lot of radio. Right. Uh, after after uh, KPF. K and Radio Free Oz, which was Peter Bergman's creation, the first counterculture uh, nighttime call-in talk show. Was uh, Harry Shearer? No, ever that's a, part a credibility of that? gap. Credibility. And that's when we they went were to after you guys. KRLA. Okay, right. We went to a commercial station, KRLA, with Radio Free Oz, and Richard Beebe and uh, and Harry and the other boys uh, would do, would do a parody of the news yes. after our show. Right, and that was the beginning of the credibility gap. That's right. Okay, uh, so. Uh, I have to follow this little thread here. Well, no, so— Oh, oh no. So the reason why Nick Danger happened— Yes. —was because we were fired from a radio station. Uh-huh. We were going to do it as a radio pilot for a series. Nick Danger, Third Eye, would be part of, of the Fireside Theater— Oz radio show, right, okay, right. and we showed up at the uh, at the station. It was either KPF, uh, KPPC, or KCCP, or K right. whatever. And and the doors were locked. Mm -hmm. They had overnight changed their management. Oh, of course. And they'd gone, I think, to Hasidic cowboy uh, uh, radio or something. And and this happens <laughs> tough when, to beat. By yeah, the way. tough to beat uh, from 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 you know comedy and and, and rock and roll. And uh, we we coined the phrase because of all of our radio experience. Radio is a heartbreak. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, if you go to the, the Firesign Theater website, firesigntheater.com, there's one book that we put together called Duke of Madness Motors, mm -hmm. which has an MP3 of 80 hours of our radio show. Well, there you go. Please do this, folks. Yeah, and there's more. There's, and, and I'll give you one of those, too. Uh, and there's more. If you go to the website, firesigntheater.com, there's an old uh, radio there icon. And if you click on that, you can hear Firesign Theater stuff 24-7. Oh my! Yeah, there's a, a, a company called Muse, which or Musiter, I think it's called, which uh, is is streaming, streaming fireside theater stuff as they should be. You know, which it's odd because again, a 50 year career. All right, that means a lot of a lot of our fans are dead. Sure, but I thought well, I want to encourage <laughs> people uh, who are who were not familiar with fireside theater oh, yeah. prior to this podcast to do yourself a solid if you want. Thanks. thanks. If you want to know. Um, why I made such a, a big deal about they being my introduction to subversive comedy and even what yeah. that means. That's you know, right. it's not just clever wordplay. Um, we were deprogrammers. Yeah, you we were. We really were. But while entertaining and being ridiculously funny. Yeah, and, and we were inspired by the goon shows. He stopped you know, on a dime. Unfortunately, that dime, dime was, was in, in the Mr. pocket. Coco's pocket. <laughs> That's right. That's, That's right. right. Yeah, and, uh, yeah we, we were inspired by a surrealistic comedy uh, program that we all, all the four members uh, had in common called the goon shows. The goon show, yeah. With Spike Milligan and Peter Sellers. Yes. And uh, again, you can Google the goons. Uh, As you should. 
good. I, I advise you to Google the goons anytime you can, and you'll hear some of the craziest comedy you've ever heard in a half hour format. And they were on the air in England during all the war years mm. and into the the fifties as well. So we we shared the Firestone Theater shared a love of radio, growing up on ra- listening to radio, the love of the imagination, the movies for the mind. But we also shared a certain love of surrealism and and technical virtuosity. Right. And we were given an opportunity because we didn't have to pay for our studio time yes. to do these wonderful complex records over a long period of time as the technology evolved. Sure. Right? Because when we started, the tapes were something like, I don't know, 12 ta- twelve track or 10 track tapes. That, uh, and it was plastic tape, folks. Wow. <laughs> right? And then, the uh, but but the uh, they got bigger and bigger. They got to be you know, 15 tracks and 25 tracks. And by the time we finished, there were these huge reels of tape, like two inches wide, yeah. with 100 tracks on them. Unbelievable. And then it all went away. Oh, right. Everything became digital. That's right. The one part of the examination you don't like Digital. Yeah. <laughs> Bend over. Yeah. That's <laughs> and, right. And listen to this. Yeah. So uh, I get my digits. Yeah. In and the studios disappeared. Suddenly you had a little box that was a studio. Right. And you could carry it around. So we did location recording and all kinds of things like that. But the the fourth record in the in the quadrology, how can you be no, first it was waiting for the electrician or someone like him, That's which was predictive of the overthrow of the Soviet Union. Yep. Because the second side of that was this tale of a, a revolution in a uh, unnamed European, Eastern European country. Right. Now, do you know uh, that the actual revolution that led to the downfall of the Soviet Union started in Poland, and it was called the Solidarność Movement, and the head of it was a guy named Lech Walesa. Now, the title of the album is Waiting for the Electrician or something like him. Do you know what Lech Walesa's job was? Electrician. As a, yes, he was a ship's electrician in the Union. We didn't know that. No, you, you know, made it up. We made it up. We made it up because— And then made it happen. And made it happen. But uh, there's lots of stuff like that. Sure. Really weird, predictive stuff. But my favorite, and I'll see if I can demonstrate it to you, uh, is in I think we're all bozos on this bus, which predicted the computer revolution. And it predicted hackers. Wow. And it predicted planting a virus in a mainframe computer and making it crash. Wow. And I played the, the major character, Clem, uh, who was uh, been fired from this uh, future fair, which is a government fair uh, uh, like a Disneyland sure. that was designed to make you feel good about you know the, your, the administration. And in it, uh, I broke the president. The first thing I did was I break the automated president right. by asking him questions he can't answer. And then I break into the mainframe computer called Dr. Memory, Direct Readout Memory, and I, I ask it a question that it can't answer, and it destroys the, the machine. question being. Now, I have in my hand an iPhone. You do. And I'm going to ask Siri something, see if I can make this happen. Now, hold on a second. You got out of the photo thing. Here we go. Uh, Siri, come on, Siri, baby. Come on, baby. Don't let me down now. Come on, Siri. Come on. Come on. She's there when you need her. Here we are. This is worker speaking. Hello. Hello, Aklem. What function can I perform for you? LOL. I'm Clem. How did this get in there? Who put this in here? A little guy named Steve Jobs. That's right. Oh, I'm going to reveal something to you now that that not too many people know because it hasn't been publicly announced. The Library of Congress has purchased the Firesign Theater archives. What? Yes, for a half a million dollars. We learned that about two months ago, and they're going to announce it soon, but... That's what happened now. What does that mean? What does it mean? It means Other than writing a giant check. It, well, it, we're going to ship all of our original tapes and stuff uh, to Washington, D.C., and they to will To be then, curated. To be curated, and then they'll have like Firesign Theater Week or something like that. You know, or there'll be a Firesign Theater Room. Oh, Phil, this is it's truly— It's very exciting. And and they we did a command—David Peter, uh, Osman and I did a command performance at the end of September— uh, before they made this announcement, uh, at the Coolidge Theater in Washington D.C. Oh my! Washington ACDC actually it was at the right. time. Uh, but command uh, performers for a queen, not the right, queen. Right, right. Alternate comedy, uh, alternate. Sure. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, this particular uh, Easter egg, which is in the iPhone, was placed there by Steve Jobs when we were. As we are going through our stuff to find the stuff to send to Washington, we found a picture 
of a, uh, a record store appearance that we did in like Oakland mm. in the 70s. Sure, early. And there's a young man there. In a black sweater. Yes, with a beard, goatee, long black hair, Steve Jobs, talking with us, getting signed records. That's right. So I inspired. Didn't, I didn't know this, but when, when I did voices for Pixar movies, uh, both Dave Osman and I are in uh, Bug's Life. Mm -hmm. He had a very nice part opposite Phyllis Diller, right. who I love, by the way. Of course. And, and, I, and I did you know, a myriad of voices again. And at the party, the cast and crew party, right. I met Steve Jobs oh, no. for what I thought was the first time. And he said. And he said, I'm a big fan of yours. We've met before. You know, he did. I wish he had. Mm -hmm. But just by saying I'm a big fan of yours, I should have gone, oh, I'm, I'm hip. You know? Yeah, yeah. But, but th that's why he put this this. Now explain homage. a little more what, what actually this you is where, did. Okay. Uh, 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 hello, Aklam. This is, oh no, what I say is this is worker speaking. Hello. That this was is my worker. Worker speaking. Because I was, I used to be a worker at the Future Fair. This is our backstory. So, but I'm uh, saying you program fired. that into your own phone. Whenever you speak to Siri, you say, this is worker? No, if anybody says to Siri, this is worker speaking, hello, she'll say to you, hello, I Clem, in a robot voice, in a computer voice, hello, I Clem. You see, what? we didn't have any backstory, so we just thought you programmed all no, of that. No, no, Steve Jobs put this in there. This is Worker speaking. This is worker speaking. Hello. That's the way I got into the mainframe computer in the record. See? That's crazy. That was like the, the little code. The I have to write this code. down. This is Cody, can speaking. you write that down? This is worker speaking. Hello. Hello. Um, It'll work every time. And, yeah. and, and the question, the, the uh, virus that we planted in the computer mm. was a question a Zen question that the computer couldn't answer in a yes or a no. Right. And that question was, why does the porridge bird lay his egg in the air? Mm -hmm. And the story behind that had to do with a girlfriend of mine in Texas who used to, <laughs> please, named Angel. Is this a song? <laughs> yeah, Angel in ding, Austin. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah, and she used to, to talk to leprechauns in her backyard in Austin. Well, don't and, say it like no one else does. Well, okay, all right, I know. And, and so one, in one of the little play sessions, the, uh, the leprechaun uh, said mis mischievously to her, why does the porridge bird lay his egg in the air, and then laughed and ran away. And when I heard this story, I said, well, this sounds, I've got to put that in the record. Yeah, you know? no, that's terrific. It's got to be the record. Uh, and if you say that to Siri, she doesn't always do it, but sometimes she'll say, you can't shut me down that easily. Let's try. Well, I'll try it. But yeah. I don't know if she'll. Come on, Siri. Wake up. Try again. Look at this. I have to open my phone. Okay, here we go. Uh, here we go, Siri. Oh, Siri, talk. Here we go. Come on, Siri. Talk amongst yourselves, folks. Siri's sleeping. Oh. Why does the porridge bird lay his egg in the air? Okay. I found this on the web for no. why does the porridge bird lay his egg in the air? No, no. Let's she, see what she, she said. She sent me to, I think we're all bozos on this bus, for example. But is interpreted, and then there's a whole interpretation of it. But she didn't say what she sometimes says. You did say it was sometimes. Sometimes. Let's uh, jump around a little and come back. I want to hear a little bit about, you've worked in many films, but share whatever you yeah. can about working on a movie called A Safe Place, co-starring oh Orson Welles and Jack Nichols. Yeah. Uh, in New York, one of my friends was a guy named Henry Jaglum. And Henry Jaglum. Uh, Wonderful filmmaker. A very interesting auteur, very distinctive. Sure. So, you know, he's his own studio. Very unique And voice. he's had a very, very unique uh, career. And uh, at the time, he was uh, working uh, with the actor's studio, the playwright's mm -hmm. division. And uh, he had written a play, uh, which ironically is called The Snowball Tree, later became known as A Safe Place. Snowball Tree is a title that I think he got from me for some strange reason, because that's a Russian song. Oh, wow. It's called Kalinka. Kalinka, 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 Maya. Sadu Yagata, Malinka, Malinka, Maya. Okay. Again, uh, thank you for stopping yes, for when you stopping did. stopping what I did, right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we performed it with Karen Black, Bonnie Bedelia, Richard Pryor, me, and Charlie Deercup, who was a, a wonderful character actor, and, and some, some other actors, at the actor's studio. And uh, Henry... His career, my career started going off in this fire sound theater direction. His career uh, went into a film direction. He did editing on Easy Rider. Wow. And I was connected to Easy Rider through 
uh, Brandon DeWilda, who okay. I'd understudied to play in New York, and we became very close friends, drove out to California together, met up with Peter Fonda. Peter Fonda wanted to do research for his movie Easy Rider. Right. And an Easy Rider, by the way, is a, a man who lives off of prostitutes. He lives with a prostitute and lives off of her, her money. That's where that term and That's is. what an Easy Rider is. So, uh, and, and so Peter wants to do research. So we go down to the Sunset Strip. Where the, now, when you say uh, live off of prostitutes, is yeah. that a, a different way of saying a pimp? No, because this is the guy who's living with the prostitute. Oh, he's like they don't a work, boyfriend. They don't work for him. No, he's a boyfriend. He, he's a hanger-on. Yeah, he's he's a lover. He's a boyfriend. You know. Sure. Uh, I've never heard this before. I know. Sorry. And, and, and uh, Terry Terry Christian, uh, the guy who wrote The Magic Christian, uh, told Peter Fonda about this. Terry something. Other. Anyway, uh, I, I but I digress <laughs> All right. before I egress. So we go down to the Sunset Strip because they're, they want to impose a curfew on the young people. Sure. All right. Remember, this is a time— <laughs> Of endless war, yeah, right, and protests, right. So a little bit like now, and so uh, we, uh, Brandon and Peter and I go down to become a part of the, the youth protest against the curfew mm. on the Sunset Strip to, to try to keep the kids from protesting and all this. And during this demonstration, they, they had the the LA cops on one side and the sheriffs on the other, and they're doing their pincher movement to create a riot. Mm. All right, and so we all just sit down. We're not, we shall not be moved. And I sit down on an open issue of the LA Free Press, right. the radical press of a time. I pull it out from under my ass. I have sat down on Peter Bergman's face. Oh, no. I didn't know Peter Bergman <laughs> was even in California. And it said, KPFK newsman Peter Bergman interviews returning Vietnam War veterans. That's what prompted me to call him sure. the next day, go down to participate in his show, Radio Free Oz, where he was known as The Wiz. Right. And I met Dave Osman and, and Phil Austin, the other two fire signs. That's ridiculous. Right. And we started improvising together right from the get-go. Right. And, and the fire sign theater was born, really, at that – from that connection to Peter Fonda. Okay, uh, Henry Jaglum. Yes. Henry Jaglum ends up editing some of Easy Rider. Sure. So he gets a, a, a film, he gets a job, uh, he gets a, a, a green light from uh, Bob Rafelson. It was BBR Productions mm -hmm. uh, who, who produced that, that wonderful movie. And so he decides to do Snowball Tree, A Safe Place, which was originally the story of well, Tuesday Weld. So he gets Tuesday Weld to star in the movie. Crazy. Well, beautiful. Yeah, oh, Wonderful. yes. And, and he wanted me to play him because he's I, I play him and the thing, and that was great. And I got to audition with all these wonderful, beautiful women and everything. So anyway, uh, I'm cast in it. And then he... Uh, he got, he wanted to. I'm, he he has written about this in his book, uh, Luncheons with Orson, mm. or Lunch with Orson. Pardon me, Orson, which I, I highly recommend. But he somehow uh, wrote a part for Orson Welles, and so Orson Welles shows up in in this hotel, and he goes in and. And Wells knows that he's a first-time movie maker. He's never made a film before. So he's very, you know, I just, and he's read the thing, and he's, I don't understand it. It was the part of a, uh, uh, of a, of a, a fallen rabbi, if you will, a mm -hmm. fallen rabbi. And, and so he, 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 he spends an, an evening trying to convince Orson Welles to be in his movie. Right. Because he admires him so much. Sure. And finally Orson says, can I do magic? Because he was an amateur magician. Right. Henry says, sure. Okay, I'll do it. And he's asking, can his character do magic? Yes, can my character, can my rabbi do, do magic? So he's, 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 an, he's a rabbi who's an amateur magician. Finally. Yeah, right, in the movie. But then some mystical things happen, of course. And he's Tuesday Weld's confidant, all right, mentor or whatever. So uh, there, and uh, I get to work with him, at least. No, I didn't have any direct scenes with him, but I got to watch him work, mm -hmm. you know. And, and uh, I'll tell you a, a funny story about him. But then my major scene was with Jack Nicholson. Crazy. Because— Henry had edited Easy Rider, yep. so Jack was available. Happy to do it. Yeah, and so uh, and, and and Henry's technique for those who don't know his films is a combination, a lot like Firesign Theater, of writing and improvisation. Okay, the writing part uh, it, it is the hard part, and that comes first. But then 
at the moment of either recording for mm. Fireside Theater or filming. or filming, and you know this too. It, you have a, a certain aspect. It depends on who you're working with, but you, right. you have the opportunity to investigate things and make it more real. Or, Create lightning in a bottle. That's right. Yeah. And, that, and the scene that I did with <laughs> Jack Nicholson and Tuesday Weld, if you ever see the movie, was almost entirely improvised. And it was... It, everybody knew how to do it right. and loved doing it. And right. so it came off so beautifully. Now, Orson Welles, and he's known for this, he, he would, he'd do a movie role, then he'd hang around, okay, living in the hotel sure. for as long as he could. And he was always writing a, a screenplay. He was working on a thing called The Other Side of the Wind or something. So he borrowed a correcting selectric, which was a, a fancy typewriter at oh, the time, yeah. from the hotel. And he stayed in the hotel for a couple of weeks working on <laughs> on uh, on the, the screenplay. And then he left and he took the typewriter with him. Always a good move. I said he ate it. <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> but he, but, and he used to hold court every <laughs> evening down in the lobby of the Essex house where we were, uh, where they put us up, right. talking to young film students yeah. about movies. And I mean, he, he's a very, he's a big, generous, he was a big, generous man. Yeah, I had a most, uh, uh, Odd encounter. I'm uh, sure they all were. Sure. Odd. Merv Griffin loved Orson Welles, had him on all the time mm -hmm. on his daytime talk show. Mm -hmm. And Merv also loved comedians. That's right. So I think I was on three times in about six months. Mm, that's um, great. And Merv would do two tapings in a day. Mm -hmm. And in the early show, he had Orson Welles on who sat in the chair next to him and told great stories and did a little magic. Mm -hmm. And then in the afternoon taping, I was on. And, I, you know, stand-ups don't – it was quite rare um, to be brought over to the couch. Yes. Um, Alan King was the first guest. And after I did my stand-up, Alan King um, encouraged uh, Merv Griffin to go over and uh, bring me back to the couch so we could continue talking. So I sat in that seat that Orson Welles had sat in only a few hours before, and that evening he passed away. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, Henry was the first one to find out that, he's, that he'd passed away because he called him that night and, and he didn't answer. Right. And, oh, my God, that's – that's a wonderful Yeah, I, the, no connection whatsoever, just a weird happenstance uh, moment in time. Well, you know, he was so big when he died that he had to, uh, to ha have a special reinforced chair. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Merv Griffin, he probably just had a strong chair. But when he was doing his editing and everything, because another friend of mine named Stanley Schiff, uh, for whom I did a movie called Lobster Man from Mars. Y yes. Oh, yeah. I, I've, I've done it. Oh, a, no, that's in here in the dossier. Is, that's right. Absolutely. With, with Tony Curtis. Correct, continue. That's I worked with Tony Curtis. Uh, anyway, uh, when, when uh, uh, he was – Stanley was also an editor and so he, he, he worked with, with, Hen, with, with um, uh, Orson. Yes. He had to have – he had to carry this special reinforced chair because he weighed like 350 Oh, absolutely. Like now, um, it's time for two uh, segments in the show. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're getting close to being out of time. I can't thank you enough. It's great and, uh, fun. Tell folks to go to Amazon to get the... Uh, and, uh, it, it, where's my fortune cookie? Where's my fortune cookie? That's right. Uh, this first segment is uh, Kevin's Pop Quiz. Okay. Uh, between 5 and 15 points possible for each of the three questions. Uh -oh. Once the final score is tabulated, it will be posted on our website along with the current standing of among the top 100. Are you ready? Oh, well, I'll give it a try. Question number one. Yes. Sammy Davis Jr. or Ann B. Davis? Oh, Sammy Davis Jr. Correct. Carl Weathers or the weather in Carlsbad? Carl Weathers. And last question, Keith? Oberman? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> All right, you did very well. I'll let you know as soon as I can. Okay. I don't know where you Good. stand in the top 100. Good. And Those then, are very provocative, I must say. <laughs> I was I studied at the feet of subversive comedy. <laughs> this is where this comes from. Uh, and then uh, the last— uh, That's the smell of defeat. That is. <laughs> that is exactly this. But I told you they were very clean. Okay, good. Um, uh, uh, Part two. Yeah. Uh, the second to last. There are three, I realize, uh -oh. uh, segments. This one is called Ask Kevin. So this allows you to ask me anything. And it can be sincere, silly, or neither. All right. Um, 
Did you ever do a show called Comedy Break? I did with Mac and Jamie. With Mac and Jamie. It was sort of this, my discovery of sketch comedy and being yes, invited into their world. Yes, you were very good in that show. Uh, and, and you can see it online, kids, by can the way, you? Comedy Break. Yes, I didn't you even can. know that. Yes, you can. And uh, Mac just came out to visit Jamie because Jamie Alcroft, who I collaborated with in a thing called Boomers on a Bench, yes. which you can also see, uh, he had had a, a, a Widowmaker heart attack about 12 years ago. And when we were going to do Boomers on a Bench on another live show mm. uh, up in Lake Arrowhead, live radio show, uh, he started feeling kind of weak and he went to his doctor and his doctor said, you cannot do that show. If you go, if you go at 3,500 feet, you'll die. Wow. Your heart is down to 10% of what a normal heart is. Oh, yeah. You're going into, he actually said, you're fucking going into the hospital. Right now. Tomorrow, yeah, right? Yeah. right to the, tonight. And so for 80 days, he was waiting for a heart transplant. His liver had been damaged by this weak heart. So he had to, he was waiting for a liver and a heart transplant. For 80 See, days. Jamie Alcroft, 80 days. Lying in the hospital. Cedar Sinai, I'll go up and visit him. And he was always in great spirits. And he's 68 years old. Now, the cutoff time, for getting that kind of a, tra a transplant is 65. But he so charmed right. the doctors right. when they had their special meeting. They said, this man has to live. Wow. And so uh, about two months ago, yeah. he had a heart and liver transplant. He now is a 68-year-old man with a 47-year-old heart and liver in his body. And but it was a 47-year-old baboon. <laughs> no, it wasn't a baboon. It was an idiot. <laughs> but thank God it wasn't a brain transplant. Oh, right? my, yes. Monster. Monster. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is an extraordinary story. Yeah. And we celebrate Jamie Alcroft. And he who, sends his love to you. Well, he, he was very instrumental in, in starting that side of my career on television doing sketch. Oh, that's and, exciting. Uh, yeah, with Jan Hooks yep. and and, uh, and Matt Dryden, and yep. yeah, we we uh, and you so were cranking it out. It's too. A, yes, we we really did way way too much. It was a strip show. It was on a uh, five nights a week, uh, a late uh, yeah. syndication. So you'd shoot a whole bunch of them in one day. and out of order and oh, no connected man. to nothing. And who am I now? And yeah, uh, yeah, but I got to do weird stuff like Albert Brooks uh, as, as as a character, and I remember one of my favorites was. Um, I don't know that I ever saw this done anywhere else because anything that good, you yeah. know, it's going to get done elsewhere. And it was a sketch. It takes place at like a, a party, a gathering, a little cocktail in someone's house party. And um, one particular person in the gathering is clearly the life of the party and the yeah. center of everyone's attention. And in fact, that person says, um, let me just go check on something, leaves the room and everyone stops. <laughs> everyone shuts down. Nobody moves. And then the person comes back and everyone comes back to life. <laughs> and I just thought it was uh, wildly clever. That uh, is. Our, our last um, – And surreal. And surreal and beautifully surreal, mm -hmm. which was at the very epicenter of the Fire Sign Theater. Mm -hmm. The last part of the show is uh, your uh, outing, uh, playing the Larry King game. Now, the Larry King game mm -hmm. will draw upon your wonderful skills as an improviser. Uh, you, of course, remember Larry from the uh, CNN. Uh, yeah, uh, I saw him recently at a screening, actually. Oh, great. Yeah, with a young chick on his arm. Well, that's how Larry does. Yes, um, yes. So and, keeps him young. Yeah. By the way, we should point out it was a, a, a very young chicken. That yes, it was just a little, to. It was a bird. A little, little yellow a chick. Chick, chicky. Um, so the Larry King game is when Larry would do his show right before he would go right. to the phones. Yes, or the bathroom. Yeah, he would look down the camera and suddenly share something, a thought of he had or an opinion he had, or King's things, and then go to the phone. And when he stared down the barrel of the camera and shared something, it was invariably something that no one needed to know or cared about. So when playing the Larry King game, mm -hmm. I want a bad Larry King impression. I don't want a good one. I want a bad one. All right? And then – Right before going to the phones, I want you to take a moment and share something about yourself as Larry, something about Larry. Okay. Anything from his past, something he had for breakfast, whatever it is, that's up to you. That's the improvised part. And then go to the phones, and if the name of the city is funny sounding, it'll be a nice little uh, button. <laughs> Karen, it's been wonderful uh, talking to you. I wish I could hear you. But it has been interesting to, to see your mouth move. move. <laughs> and uh, I really didn't realize that you uh, uh, were starting to lose your memory. But, but <laughs> nonetheless, I, uh, I think that uh, people were probably entertained by that. And 
I just shit myself. <laughs> All right, let's go to the phones. Keokuk, Iowa. <laughs> Keokuk! Okay, Thank you good. so was much. That, that was beautiful. <laughs> oh, this is like a fantasy come true, honestly and truly. <laughs> since I'm 12 years old, listening to uh, Nick Danger, Third Eye. And you're still 12 years old. That's exactly right. <laughs> Thanks to you for, for, for bringing that back out in me. Um, Good. Yeah, honestly and truly, Phil, thank you so much for spending you, uh, part been, of your a pleasure. Uh, Wednesday with us today. Now sit there uncomfortably while I wrap things up for the folks okay, at home. Okay, and then I'll go down and get you a copy of the book. You certainly will. We'll be, in your, we'll be in your trunk in a moment, and I think you know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> Ladies and Jews, this has been uh, uh, episode uh, 334. Four, I want to say, Whoa. of uh, Kevin Pollock's chat show. Uh, we'll be back in the studio with guest uh, Jennifer Tilly on oh. Sunday. I'm very excited about uh, nice. talking with her. We've done a couple movies together, and she's become one of the more revered poker professionals in the last several mm. years. So we'll talk uh, all things movies and TV. Chucky, uh, one of the, uh, I guess, a series of films mm. she's done. <laughs> as well as, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And great work on Family Guy and all the stuff. Um uh, and yeah, so that uh, that will be the lo- last live in studio show of uh, the year 2017. But um, you'll hear more about that, and just follow us on uh, Twitter and all those things. Um, I want to thank Cody, our engineer here at Airwolf. Thank, thank you, Cody. Cody. Thank you um, for uh, for busying yourself for the last hour and a half while Phil and I uh, waxed uh, our cars. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, yes, and thank everyone uh, at, at, at the Fine Air, Airwolf uh, uh, Propaganda Agency uh, <laughs> for allowing us this beautiful desk and nine microphones, of which we only use two. Until next time, and as always, get out of my face. <laughs>